Hello, brethren. My name is Brian Song. My name is Wes Lackey. And we're here today to talk about COVID. I am a board certified physician assistant licensed to practice in the state of Tennessee. And I am a critical care paramedic uh, here in the state of Tennessee. So first, when we look at COVID, it's a virus. And what has made it so prevalent in today's society, it's how it's spread. First and foremost, if you must cough, cough preferably into your elbow or your shoulder. If you cough into your hands, whatever droplets you have, and that is how COVID is spread, you had now have on your fingers. So when you go, if you must use a doorknob or anything else that you touch, those will go on there for the next person to get. And that's how you begin this chain of transmission. And, that's, and that goes into our next um, t point about how we limit the, sp the spread as far as to droplets. So droplets happen whenever we talk, even when we breathe. And that's why face masks are so important in this day and age. And there are several types of cloth and face masks that we can utilize. The most that you've probably seen is a surgical mask. That's been a long-standing practice for medical providers and medical facilities, and it does a very good job. It, and you, it keeps the large droplets, the large particles, which is why if you talk for a long period of time, you may notice your face mask getting moist. That's just evidence that you are keeping particles trapped in there. And we have other face masks. So, so how do we properly wear a surgical mask for those in the audience that do not know? So to wear it, you make sure your fingers, A, don't touch the actual part of the mask around the loops and you put it over your ears like this. And the, the biggest thing is you make sure it's properly fit because a mask that is not stung to fit, fit will still be a pointless measure. So the biggest thing that I've seen to, in today's eyes is with the mask, you would prefer to have it cover your nose as well as these are entrances to which the virus can go through, whether it be your mouth, your nose, your eyes, those are all just ways you can spread the virus and it go into your system. Most people nowadays are, are starting to wear things like this out in public. Is this gonna prevent us from uh, potentially spreading the virus? While it does have some utility, these cloth gaiters, as they are called, aren't the best as to the other ones we have because you would prefer when you wear these, whether it's for some recreational activity, you don't want to keep whatever you're breathing out in. So it, it is relatively poor when it comes to containing droplets, unlike the other two masks. And then the other common uh, face mask that we see is a cloth one like this or this, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've seen some people where they have these HEPA filters uh, or carbon filters here. Is that any better than wearing a regular cloth mask? So with the HEPA filters, it helps keep particles that are normally smaller as, than the droplets I've been talking about. And it does do a better job. So in that case, it can be more efficient than this mask, the surgical mask by itself. But again, the biggest thing is wearing it correctly because no matter what mask, whether it's a surgical mask, whether it's skaters, these masks, or the N95s that we're about to allude to, if you don't wear it correctly or it doesn't fit well, it would, it would honestly be no different than had you not been wearing a mask. And so, like we just mentioned, N95s. So N95s come in multiple different fashions, right? I think this one would be considered a 95, and then we have ones that are more disposable. How long can we use an N95 here um, to protect yourself? With N95s, the important part is before you actually are given one, you go through what is known as a fit test. And this is just to make sure the mask's seal provides a good seal. And in this case, it is the best defense if, amongst all of these masks as it blocks about 95% of particles. Unfortunately, this isn't available to like the widespread public. And it, I, in an ideal world, it would be, but then you run into the problem of not every mask being custom fit. 
And that's why you see surgical masks in such a high quantity rather than N95s. So I think w our next, next topic was to talk about our hand washing, correct? Mm -hmm. And as novel as an idea as hand washing has been, even it has existed for centuries, and the principle of hand washing is, well, essentially to keep your hands clean. But like with masks, if you don't do it correctly, you have given yourself and others little protection. And so the CDC and WHO have put out guidelines how to properly wash hands, and we'll demonstrate them here in this video. All right. So we always want to first we'll rinse our hands. Make sure they're at least a little bit wet here. And so if you'll observe, there's a pattern that we go in when we wash hands. So obviously lather up and get the surfaces that you touch most. And then, to be thorough, you wash the back of the hand. And then we have a bunch of things growing under our nails. So in, in order to thoroughly wash, we do like so, just to make sure we're getting every particular surface, and even in the under. And we, we most often see people washing their hands for less than 20 seconds. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. a, a brief little da uh, dance under the water, and they're done. And while water does technically, if you go downward, it does help wash some, part, some what's on your hands down. If you're actually trying to wash your hands with soap, it's best to spend no less than 20 seconds. By the time we finish talking, it will have been the sufficient amount of time. And another thing to keep note of is when you're washing hands, to have your essentially hands point downward at a lower level than your elbows, because if you don't and you wash like this, whatever you're washing down here now travels to your wrists and you've sort of nulled the whole concept of washing your hands. So after you you've finished washing your hands, and normally there would be, this would be in a sink where you could tap, turn off the water. You first make sure your hands are sufficiently dried, and with the clean towel, not the actual surface of the skin itself, close the water. That way, you don't have to rewash your hands and essentially nullify the entire process. If you just take your newly washed hand and they expose it to uh, some other uh, germ-covered surface. And as far as hand washing goes, if we look at the mechanism, the physiology, soap doesn't so much, it can kill bacteria, but it also helps in removing germs from the actual surface. And, unders, and that's and what's hand sanitizers. The reason some hand sanitizers, most of them need to be above a certain percentage of alcohol, around 70%, that's when, because alcohol has a bactericidal effect, so it'll kill bacteria. That's what we hope to achieve. And even with hand sanitizing, a simple pump and then just a quick scrub, it, it is the same concept as hand washing, where you do need to spend some time just making sure you get under all the surfaces, in between your fingers, underneath your fingernails, anywhere that may serve as a potential living space for bacteria. So I guess I'll demonstrate our hand sanitizer here. Probably want at least two or three squirts. And again, that 20 seconds is the biggest thing, having enough of the liquid on your hands and friction to cause it to then evaporate and you now have Nice, clean, clean hands. And so now I guess we're going to try and address some of the most common myths and myth conceptions that we hear and see. The first myth I want to address is the idea and notion that masks do not work. And first off, this principle is, this is based off some uh, images where people wear this type of mask and go into some kind of work environment where they're exposed to 
a plethora of small particles, whether it be dust or a construction material, and they come out, and it's seen that the particles still make it through into basically the area of the mouth. And the, while it is true that there is no mask that 100% stops transmission, so even with N95s, there can still be some things that inevitably either get through COVID spreads in droplet transmission, i.e. larger droplets that come out when we talk, when we breathe, when we cough. And the point of the mask is to keep those droplets that come out in the mask as opposed to spreading them out to others. And while, and that is where the surgical mask comes into play, we keep this and we are able to protect others as well ourselves in case we do carry some sort of virus. And this is the practice you see in Far Eastern countries where if someone known has some kind of known ailment, whether it be the common cold or some respiratory infection, they'll wear a mask. And it's just sensible that you wear something to prevent whatever you're carrying spreading out in the open. And there is proven clinical data, both in the CDC and many other institutions, that show a clear difference in a population that doesn't wear a mask and a population that does wear a mask in relevance to the spread of COVID. On top of vaccines, another with the Pfizer and Moderna, AstraZeneca and other companies coming out with new uh, vaccines that are being clinically tested and given now with the modern technology, we're able to move away from the typical using an inactivated or dead vaccine to newer ways such as utilizing mRNA or essentially one form of genetic material. The reason we're able to move so quickly is with prior ways to make vaccines, it would take an astronomical amount of time to purify and make sure it was safe to use as a vaccine. Whereas with the mRNA and DNA, we can just modify a few um, nucleotides and bases in, the, in our genetic material into, of what we're injecting, and it'll be ready to be used. And so first, that is why it is safe to use in terms of when you compare it with other vaccines prior. And safety has always been the first and foremost concern. That's why we have phase one through three trials. That's why these have taken the time they have. It's not day one, we just shuttled out a vaccine. If we took time, Pfizer, Moderna, the, all these other studies, to have a set population at first, basically determine what dose was the vaccine most efficacious, and then on phase three, larger trials, to see how efficacious or how well it did its job. And those results have since been promising, and that's why we are able to proceed with confidence in regards to these newer vaccines. As Masons, we need to recognize that while this has not been the ideal year for anyone, it is not necessarily unprecedented. Back in 1918, we faced the Spanish flu epidemic, which at that time devastated lodges. And you had many grand lodges having to either cancel or postpone their grand convocations. Lodges had to go on dark. But after a century later, masonry still survived. And that is the case here. As we move forward in our new uh, livelihoods and masonry, uh, cohesively moving forward uh, into the future, uh, we just look forward to still convening with each other, but in a modified sense. And I hope that everyone has a safe and healthy end of the year as we move into 2021. Thank you for your time, brethren.